The Don Heron Show. With Don's guests, actress Lynn Redgrave and her husband, actor John Clark. From SCTV, comedy star Andrea Martin. Comedian Kevin Nealon. And on the art of complaining, Bill Edmondson. And now, Charlie Farkerson. One of the fellows on the show today is always sticking his nose into your consuming affairs. And I'm kind of glad he does it, because I ain't got the nerve to start one of these, uh, what he calls, clash actions. Because last week, I was trying to take something back to the departmental store uh, that I had given the wife uh, for her birthday. I'd give her a big jar of cold cream and wished her many happy returns. <laughs> and she sent me right back to the store, hoping to get many happy returns from them. <laughs> So I went to your feminine complaints department, and there's a big long lineup. And my God, I must have waited 30 minutes, approximately half an hour, before I got a chance to get my oar in. And when I got to do it, I didn't know what to say. First of all, there was so much blame noise going on. There's this big lineup, and everybody just a caterwauler about what was wrong with what they bought. My God, I figured that store must have what they call total recall. <laughs> and I was trying to give the woman in charge my name and address. And I don't think she could hear me above the noise. I said, it's Charlie Parkinson, Royal Rip 2, Polly Sun. And she shouted back, it's a madhouse, ain't it? I said, no, no, it's a private home. <laughs> then she asked me what was wrong with what I bought. And I was figuring on getting the money back, you see. But after I told her what was wrong, I couldn't get no satisfaction at all. I sure could have used this uh, Phil Edmington's book about how to get your own back from your private corpulent sexters or even your shriveled serpents in the government. Because this departmental store wouldn't give me the money back, and it says on the back of that family-sized jar of cold cream, double your money back guarantee if the stuff don't work. And I told him and told him twice that the wife had spooned out and ate more than half that jar. It never helped with cold one bit. <laughs> family. My next guest is one of the finest character actresses in this business. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to SCTV's Andrea Martin. Yeah. That's all right. Have you met uh, the Clarks? Of course I've met. We flew out here this morning together and this, I have a, a boy who is three days older than Annabelle. Um, his name is Jack. She was so, well, they're wonderful parents because they're very, as you can tell by the way they were talking with her, very patient and very calm. I could never have brought my son out here. He would be up on the boom, swinging from it, or saying, you know, or, or saying, why are you talking to that man, mommy? You know, like being really, I, I don't know if it's a boy or... It's a boy. You think that's yeah, what it is? Sure. Okay. All boys like that. Is that yes, right? Yes, oh, thank yes. Thank you. Oh, my I God. thought you two had met before. Well, we had, we'd, we'd met in a makeup room once, a long time ago. We'd sort of, hello, hello. Yes, that's yes, right. But uh -huh. that was about, we hadn't really met properly. Because, Lynn has brought a piece of film along that she'd like you to see. Yes, uh -huh. uh, perhaps I should just mention this, that I have uh, been a great admirer of Andrea's <laughs> all through SCTV and the incredible character she's played in Dira, I remember, <laughs> but particularly with great fondness. But perhaps one of my fondest and most excited moments was when one night I tuned in and heard this. Lynn Ray Grave in a new kind of hospital drama. There's a total power failure in the cafeteria. Every patient in this hospital is starving. You're the only one that can help us. We're counting on you. All right, Doctor. SCTV's wet nurse, a woman dedicated to the nurturing and sustenance of mankind. Oh, he's been a good boy all afternoon in his house. Come here. Oh, yes. Oh, hungry little boy. Have I got something for you? <laughs> Papa, let's get that little book. 
to her, her night spent tirelessly feeding her body and her mind. I think it's wonderful, and I've never been more flattered than to think well, that I could be a, a, an Andrea Martin character. I just think did, it's the best. What did Weight Watchers say? <laughs> I wasn't doing the commercials then. Oh. Now, I know the big baby was John Candy. Yeah. Who was the that little? That was my own little baby. That was, was Jack. This, I can't, he was only it? seven weeks old when we did that. I can't believe that's the only time he's ever been on yeah. television. <laughs> well, that, you're very, yeah. you know, it's always a fear of mine that people that I have done, and I certainly, well, I mean, yeah. I use your name, but it wasn't a very good impersonation of you. And I've always I, been afraid how people take that, and you really I weren't. I thought it was hysterical. <laughs> well, thank you. I think it's wonderful. You're very <laughs> But you put your best foot forward, I thought. <laughs> you do incredible the delicate impersonations. Thing. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. I, is there any dialogue, is there anything you haven't done in a character? Because you seem to be, I've, I've seen you do everything. You know, I always wanted to do Cher. Um, at one time in her career when she was doing the Sonny and Cher show. And then she started doing films and I think became um, very, not that she wasn't respected, but more respected because she challenged herself and grew. And I couldn't get myself to do her because I couldn't find... I, I just didn't, you know, get a handle on what to do about her then because she was taking herself so seriously and the audiences were and I couldn't find the right kind of thing to put her in, but she's Arme she's half Armenian and I'm all Armenian. I thought there's an opportunity. There aren't very many girls out there that um, that are your ethnic background. Is that so. secret Armenian? Is it a secret? Yeah. No, is that the secret of, of what you do? Oh, um, you know, maybe it, you're probably asking that so there'll be a joke, but there really is. No. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's see. I grew up in Portland, Maine, and you know, it's a very... They have an Armenian colony? Well, I think very few, and that's probably why I went into comedy, I guess, really, to... You know, I think why everybody does go into comedy, so maybe you'll make them laugh before they you think they're going to laugh at you for some unknown reason. But then I think I grew up to um, find the profession unneurotically, but I think maybe it started out like that. I can speak a few words of Armenian. You can? Ekmek kadaif with kaimak. No kidding. <laughs> That's my favorite dessert. It's an Armenian oh. dessert. It's kind of a fermented toast with honey. And I, and I was going to say, no, 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 but I'll meet you if you're a drink at the hotel. So, um, I love Armenian food. I do, too. Yeah. All those Delicious. I can't speak great a word of Armenian. Wrapped around. It's not very good. You can't speak it? I can't. But when I grew up, my parents, who were both Armenian, spoke Armenian as a way to keep things from us. So I never learned it. You know, I, uh, yeah. If you understand. Is that why I mean. one of the characters you say you, you it, created has no English whatsoever oh. and, and everything is understood? Maybe. maybe. Yeah. Is it sort of half Armenian that you overheard? <laughs> maybe. Can it you is. do I a little sample of, of that? What, that char no, but you know, Edith Prickly, I'm sure, is like one of my um, one of my relatives, very loud. She, I don't have a relative that wears leopard, but um, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, probably a lot of them come from different aspects of my background. And the talk show host, Libby Wolfson? Yes, yeah, Libby Wolfson. That's, That's a hard one to bring into. I'd love to be able to actually do those characters now. Well, yeah. uh, Annabelle was talking about the parrot and on the previous show. Yes. And, and you know... He, they had a parrot on... No, this is another show. Yeah. And uh, Bruce Mahler is the uh, comedian that works with this parrot. And this parrot talks all the time in Los Angeles, and they do little acts together. And when he came out here, the parrot would not talk. And backstage, I heard him going, la, 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 la. Oh, fly me to the moon. And hello, how are you doing? Talking off a blue stream. And Bruce was there, you know, why me? Why me? 
laughing to himself. Andy and Martin, we'll be back with more. Oh. <laughs> Welcome back, John Clark, Lynn Redgrave, and Andrea Martin. And you've got a wee button there on your... I do. This is, this is my Halloween button. This says UNICEF on it. And I am very proud to say that in Ontario, Canada, I am the honorary chairperson for... Chairperson. I love that. Chairperson for... Um, you know, Charwoman. Charwoman. <laughs> Right. Whatever. Whatever I can say to help this organization, and I'm sure everybody knows about UNICEF, it is an organization that helps deprived children in developing countries all over the world. And Halloween is a very, very big campaign. And for those mums out there who have candy and apples and things like that for the kids, it would be really great this year if you could have little nickels and dimes and quarters to put in the orange UNICEF boxes that the children bring around. It's for a great cause. and. Um, the children are actually very proud to be involved in helping other children, so I think it's a great organization. Can you not. imagine how they would shell out for somebody like Annabelle? I know. Oh, boy. She came up to me while I was wearing this button. She said, what's that? I said, that's a ghost. What is the ghost holding? It's a UNICEF box. Hmm. And she looked at her smarties, and she walked away, you know, thinking, <laughs> this is a much better box to be holding, you know? And she just went away with the smarties box. Now, how would your son Jack be collecting for UNICEF? Would he do that sort of thing? Oh, I hope so. Yeah? Sure, he yeah. He wouldn't be jumping around from tree to tree, as no. you said. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Well, he already informed me that he didn't want to be in a Michael Jackson mask. We unfortunately had a video that um, MTV on one night, and... Um, in Los Angeles and he caught the Michael Jackson thriller tape and it really frightened him and um, and now that's all he's thinking about in terms of Halloween so actually what UNICEF suggests is not for children to wear masks but to wear um, makeup and things because masks at that age actually frighten other children and um, so UNICEF and Max Factor suggest <laughs> right, this. right that's right, right. Yeah. yes now I understand you're coming back to us in Canada for a few hours to host the Juno Awards. That's right. On, um, gosh, when are they here? Let's see. I think, I think they're early 5th. December. Uh, yep, that's right. I'm hosting them with uh, Rick Moranis. Oh, that, that would should be fun. Be fun. I, after I've just talked about MTV, I don't have a real affinity with rock musicians, but um, I certainly love listening to the music, so it'll be fun to... You're doing it with Rick Moranis? Right. You're not going to be a Mackenzie sister. No, I'm not. No. No. That's Unless a, he forces me to do it, I well, don't know. Well, th they, they were on both on once. And, That's and right. Very well, good, but, but sometimes the audience is a little raucous. Uh-huh. Last well, time they did the awards, they had no banquet. They had a pre-cocktail hour they were on for three hours. That's right. The audience was sloshed. That's right. And they've informed me this year that they're cutting out the liquor. And I said, please give them a drink to help us. One drink, you know, because it's nice for the audience to be a little bit relaxed. But I think that was a problem. That will be exciting. Mm -hmm. you, but you like to work live. You like to improvise. Yeah, I, I don't like improvising, but I do like You don't like improvising? No, I really don't. To think I've made a career out of it, but I really don't like doing it. You mean what you really want to do is settle down with a nice, fat, script and memorize it? <laughs> I like that. I do. <laughs> I really do. But yeah. you were so brilliant doing that parrot a minute ago. <laughs> oh, gee, well, could we build a series around it? I don't know. I mean, it's good for a talk show, Don, but um, I don't know. <laughs> well, Before I... you take over the show with your parrot, I'm going to say thank you for coming, Andrew okay. Martin. Please come back again. Thanks, Look Don. forward to the show. Stay tuned for Kevin Neal. Coming up next. <laughs> thank you. Welcome back. One way to discover the best plane. Please welcome consumer advocate Phil Edmonston. Is that true what I just said? There really is an art to complaining? Oh, I think so, sure. Uh, especially here in Canada because we, uh, we're not such good complainers. We many times are... We're gripers. We gripe about a lot, but we don't... Uh, All the time. Yeah, when we don't just, take action against the sea of troubles. Oh, it's true. Well, in, in Canada, we're afraid of confrontation. We like to compromise, but if the manufacturer or the person who gives you a, a poor uh, service doesn't want to compromise, uh, it doesn't work very well. Well, not in politics. It's not true, is it? Because that's a, we just gone through a period of confrontation. <laughs> and in British Columbia, it's always confrontation time. It, so, but you mean it doesn't it, happen with consumers? Well, it can change from province to province. You'll find that French Canadian consumers are much more confrontation minded than uh, English Canadians. And uh, also in certain provinces, such as British Columbia and, uh, and, and Quebec. Now, do they complain at the right time and about the right things? Cause 
Not really. What happens is that uh, many people will just uh, blow up and say that uh, I'm never coming to this particular store again or you're a bunch of thieves and I'm leaving and that's it. And uh, that really doesn't help the situation. What you want to do is uh, try to see the person who is a policy maker, someone who's just not implementing policy which has already been made, but someone who can, who can actually uh, uh, give you the compensation that you deserve. You mean it's the let me see the manager syndrome? That helps many times, sure. Yeah. Particularly in retail stores it helps. And at, at, uh, at lower levels or when, when you're dealing in a restaurant, it certainly uh, you don't even have to see the manager or the maitre d'. You can just talk with the waitress and ask the waitress to change uh, the food because you don't like it. I, in doing this book, I found I interviewed a lot of, of people working in restaurants uh, who, who serve uh, clients, and they told me that many times they knew that the food had been complained about by other people or a, a certain uh, brand of wine and they would have gladly taken it back and yet people were intimidated. They were actually drinking <laughs> the wine which was not very good or of the food which had been a bit tainted and we're not saying a thing because it was a fancy restaurant. That's the way we are. And is it wise to be keep your temper and, and, and do it in a calm, orderly manner? Or well, it depends. Or is it better to get the squeaky wheel against the grease? Usually that, that's the case. Uh, not being a constant complainer, but what you want to do is, if you're dealing with a manufacturer of a product, uh, general, the best thing to do is try to phone up and get someone who can, who can make, uh, who can take the product back or make the decision to give you some compensation. But many times you might, you you come up to someone who says that's policy and there's nothing else we can do. I'm sorry. Do things ever happen on the phone? Oh. Very, very seldom when you're dealing with mega corporations can you get beyond the first uh, uh, line of attack. But generally what you can do is send a registered letter, and that's very effective. Ah. Uh, registered letter. That is, the post on. office is not on strike. That's right. And then there's nothing you can do with the post office except perhaps change your government, <laughs> but uh, which has been done. We'll see what happens after that. But uh, once you get uh, to the point of writing a registered letter, there are things that you should put in a registered letter that many people forget, which will really make it more effective. For example, um, you want to give the person that you're writing the letter to a number of options, not just simply say, I want my money back. Uh, you might uh, want to uh, have part of the money back and keep the product and repair it yourself, or you just want the product repaired, or you might just simply uh, want, want something else uh, from the manufacturer, or some compensation in addition to what you had paid for the product because it caused you some, some additional losses. Uh, you put that in your letter. Also, you should put in your letter a period of time that you're expecting them to respond to you. Many people send a letter saying, and I want this letter answered, and please, Right. Okay, please. <laughs> and that gives them an out if you don't put, say, within, what, 10 days? Well, generally days within or? 10 days, that they know that uh, uh, failing that 10-day period, if they don't respond, that they will have to uh, perhaps go to small, or be defendants in a small claims court action. In writing the book, I found out that a small claims court across Canada, uh, the different small claims courts, you can ask from between 500 and $3,000 and you don't need a lawyer. And, and that's really the beauty of this. The, the judges who are in the small claims courts are consumers themselves and had ha they've had these situations before and they've heard all sorts of excuses. Uh, some people were uh, complaining and asking for compensation from one car company because their paint was flaking prematurely. The paint was peeling off. And uh, the company from the, the representative of this company before a small claims court was telling the judge that it wasn't a problem with the paint, it was just bird excrement which was eating into the paint. And it was just th these model cars it seems that the birds were attracted to. And the judges, everyone was, was listening to the story and <laughs> didn't, they didn't get very far with it. And then the consumer got about $900 to get another paint job. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and this is why it's very effective, the small claims courts. Uh, if the facts speak for themselves, if you hold your temper and if you send that registered letter, now not only can you fight City Hall, but you can fight General Motors as well. Now, when you talk about General Motors, so what about class actions? That seems to be have more, more, more clout than, than one guy. Well, in the United States, class actions have been very effective. In Canada, the only province with class actions is the province of Quebec. And even there, it has been... Uh, really, uh, I'd say, sabotaged by different legal opinions as far as the, it, it's, it's only about four years old now, and the, and the legal opinions from the judges which have come from the courts have been generally uh, slowed down most of the class actions from having any definitive judgment, so that now what has happened is that uh, unless you have uh, quite a bit of money, or unless you have quite a bit of time, the class action route uh, right now isn't the most effective one. A better one is to have, if you have a number of people, say, uh, 
two or three hundred people or even uh, up to a thousand people with a similar type claim, organize them to put in claims in small claims court, these different, maybe several hundred claims, and the company or the provider of this service cannot really defend himself or, or the company cannot defend itself before the court, and generally, generally they'll just settle out of court because they know that they're wrong. So it's a cut of chain reaction instead of a class action. That's right. But what you, what you, what you have to do is organize people. When we talked about how people generally are, will gripe but won't do anything after that, uh, what you have to do is show them that other people have won. Uh, ten years ago, we had a, a problem with um, the Rusty Fords, <laughs> and we organized groups called the Rusty Ford Owners Associations. And we didn't even have class actions at the time, but we initiated them anyhow. You can, in you can initiate class actions if you don't have them and just hope that they don't get to court stage. And uh, be, by doing that, we got approximately $2.8 million in a final settlement from, settlement from the Ford Motor Company because uh, it had hurt their sales. Not that we'd gone to court and got the money, but it had hurt their, their sales so much, the publicity, and, and they realized that we were right on the premature rusting of their vehicles that they gave a corrosion code of five years, which the other car companies have come, uh, uh, come up with, and, 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 and American car companies in the States have given three years. They're, they're, they're not as perhaps as enlightened as the companies here are. But uh, really, from just one single complaint and organizing the people together, we were able to get that reform. So, Phil, are you the equivalent of Ralph Nader in this country? Oh, I wouldn't say that I'm the equivalent of Ralph. I worked with Ralph in Washington, but... Uh, but he gets his own claims, didn't he? He gets his claim for being bumped off an airline or something? Oh, sure. And, and, and you can uh, get... In Canada, you can get compensation. Any time that a company is negligent or, or a product is poorly manufactured, you can get some compensation if you ask for it. Many companies have, have uh, slush funds. If you complain about your cigarette being, being stale, they'll buy you a pack of cigarettes or a carton and have it sent to your door, or, or a case of cheese or a case of soup. They do this all the time because they're interested in good public relations. I think that's, tr that's good. But uh, as far as comparing with Ralph Nader, I have too much respect for him to say that I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm him here. What about all those farmers that were sort of got together against the banks. Is oh, it's worked. In, in Calgary, for example, they, they were foreclosing on mortgages and, and, and many people were saying, look, we cannot handle this and we're going to organize ourselves together. And they walked on down to the bank and they said, we'll give it up right away. How would you like to have a dozen farms to try to unload? And the bank doesn't want this. And they started discussing terms. But if one guy came in and said, how would you like one farm to unload? Heck, sure. That's it. So there is strength, there is power in numbers, and if you have a legitimate claim, and if other people have legitimate claims, particularly against the government and, and government bureaucrats, you can really force these people to change and you can reform the system. Even if you're all alone, though, and you don't like the way the guy fixed your car, what do you do then? Oh, uh, what you've got to do is always find an independent person who can confirm that you're just not crazy in your complaint, that you've got a legitimate That gripe. could be hard to find. Well, with professionals, Doctors, lawyers, accountants who can't count as a problem. But not with mechanics, they're generally an independent breed. Okay, Phil, I'm going to try it. Okay. Thank you for coming aboard. Phil Edmondson, the art of complaining. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, John. Come back and see us again here every day. Number two, Kevin. No complaints here. Promotional consideration provided by Wall. At last, a place to soothe tired feet. The Wall Cushion Foot Massager, convenient and portable. Brought to you by Wall, the masters of massage. And Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. Makes any meal special and special meals extraordinary. Long Grain and Wild Rice from Uncle Ben's. Don Heron's Wardrobe by Pierre Cardin, the world's premier designer, featuring the latest fashions for the man in your life. Available at fine stores coast to coast in Canada. Pierre Cardin.